Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults is verse 12. Okay. I don't think I mentioned it, though I did say last week. You have 10 seconds to begin your answer, and then a total of, what do we say, 30 seconds to complete your answer. Next question is, finish the verse and tell me the reference. There is no speech. Mrs. Lang? Chapter 19, verse 3. That is correct. Okay, Mrs. Lang is quizzed out. Okay, here's our next one. In verse 8, what rejoices the heart? Riley. Okay, incorrect. Who's next? Mrs. McGovern, I think. Mrs. McGovern? The statutes of the Lord. The statutes of the Lord, that is correct. In verse 8, what rejoices the heart? The statutes of the Lord. Very good. Okay, and the next one is, quote the verse and the reference that has the following words in the verse. There is nothing hid from the heat thereof. Maranatha? Incorrect. Who's next? Mrs. McGovern? The Almighty has gone out from all the earth, and they were to the end of the world. And that has he set a tabernacle for the sun. And that is not. <coughs> That's okay. Um, the question was, quote, the verse and the reference that has the words, there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. That is verse 6. His going forth is from the end of the heaven and circuit unto the ends of it. There is nothing hid from the heat thereof. It's a very, little more challenging. Here's another one. In verse 5, how does the sun rejoice? Sophia? Okay, incorrect. Philip? As a strong man to run a race. As a, as a strong man to run a race. How does the son rejoice? It does say, which is as a bridegroom cometh out of his chamber and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. Okay? Here's another great challenge. List the four types of sin mentioned in verses 12 and 13. McGovern? Errors. Yes. Secret faults. Yes. Presumptuous sin. Yes. Great transgression. Correct. That would be errors, secret faults, presumptuous sins, and the great transgression. Very good. Now I'm going to ask a series of six questions that in my mind all go together. According to Psalm 19, 1 to 6, we are surrounded by the natural revelation of who? I think it was Elijah. No, incorrect. Who was next? Mrs. McGovern? The Creator. Creator God, that's correct. Okay, here's the. Now, I would like you to. Quote the verse in answer to the question. In verse 2, the term in terms of time, how often does creation reveal God? How often does creation reveal God? Day and night. 
quote the verse. Wait, the plan failures between the two men. That's correct. The question was in terms of time, how often does creation reveal God? Day unto day, utter his speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. The next question is in terms of people groups, God reveals himself in what language? Quote verse 3. Philip. Very good, very good. Next question. In terms of geographical locations, God reveals himself where? Quote, quote verse 4. Their light has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world, and then have they set a tabernacle for the sun. Good, very good. In terms of creation rejoicing, to reveal God, what picture is used? Quote verse 5. Fill it again. Which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoice it as a strong man to run away. Good. Philip's out. Quizzed out. Good job, Philip. Last question in that set. In terms of the atheist who claims he cannot see God, who can hide from the heat of the sun? In quote verse 6. Okay. Who's next? Josiah? That is the answer. Can you quote the verse? Well, you've got the part of the verse. That's very good. The, the verse says, His going forth is from the end of the heaven and circuit unto the ends of, the, of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. Okay. Here's another challenging one. From verses 7 to 9, give me seven things that the Word of God is. You can just say that. Yeah. Perfect. Sure. Right. Time. Time. Okay. So the seven things the Word of God is. The Word of God, the law is perfect, sure, right, pure, clean, true, and righteous altogether. That's hard to fit into 30 seconds. Probably not a good question. Okay. A little easier. What foods are found in Psalm 19? Elijah? What food? Good job. Honey and honeycomb. <laughs> Excellent. What foods are found in Psalm 19? Honey and honeycomb. Next, what sport is found in Psalm 19? Yes. Good. Strong man running a race. Very good. Good job, Peyton. And then what precious metal is found in Psalm 19? Gold. gold. I'll, I'll accept that. Gold. Much fine gold. Fill in the blank. The heavens and firmament are a blank for the sun. Hi. No. Who's next? Mrs. McGovern? Tabernacle. Good job. Tabernacle. Mrs. McGovern, Mrs. McGovern is quizzed out. In verse 9, what is true? No. Incorrect? Yes. The judgments of the Lord. All right. Excellent. The judgments of the Lord. Very, very good. And 
Then the next, what does the psalmist know that God can see? According to verse 14, what is in God's sight? Doing a terrific job raising your hand fast. Riley? Riley? Um, the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart. Excellent. God can see the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart. Okay, next question. What does David not want to have dominion over him? Josiah? Who's next? Presumptuous, Presumptuous sins. sins. Very good. And then, what does David want to be innocent from? John. Great transgression. Great transgression. Very good. Repeating some from last week. What does this? What does David call himself in verse eleven? Okay, very good. What does David call himself in verse 11? By them is thy servant warned. Okay. And then the next one is in verse 14, what does David call the Lord? I think that was John. Strength and Redeemer. Mm -hmm. My strength and my Redeemer. Very good. And then what? Uttereth speech. Elijah? Uh, day unto day. day. Very good. And then we have a few more. Another hard one. In verse 12, what can man not understand? His errors. Incomplete. Uh, secret faults. Secret faults. His errors and secret faults. What two things can man not understand? His own errors and secret faults. Very good. And then finish the verse. The fear of the Lord. Is it Maranatha? Very good. Very good. She's out? Okay, good job, Maranatha. And one more. Verse 11 says that great reward is found in what? And keeping them, and keeping God's commandments. Very, very good. Okay. John was out too. Excellent. Very good. Well, great job. Well, this, this concludes our practice rounds. So the actual, true, real, authentic, and final round, which is the real deal, will be held next Sunday, yea, verily, when Dr. Chris Schepler is here. So you'll have an audience, and um, I'm going to be giving him the questions and allowing him to ask the questions. And um, so I cannot guarantee you how all the questions are going to be exactly framed, but I'm going to be handing him these very questions and a few more, and I'll let him take his pick. And he will be the judge if he's up to it. And uh, we're going to have a... Um, around next week that uh, will be same time but dr shepler will preside is the plan and uh, do we have any questions at all any questions how many would say that today was harder than last time today was harder than last time okay okay very good question i did have a question so the last question about um in what was thy servant born um and the answer was in them. In the keeping of them. Right. Yes. And I didn't know if we had to answer what was them, which was the judgments or all six. Ah, good question. Them. 
Yes, it's in the keeping of them, which is all six. Yes, but that wasn't what I was thinking when I asked the question. I was thinking, um, what does the reward come from? I, I should probably clarify that. Um, it was just a general question about, is everything after judgments connected to judgments, or is it the whole list? I think it's the whole list. I think it's, it's a good, good question, because I believe the word judgments is plural. Yeah. But so you could say, does it all refer just to judgments? But I it's my understanding that's the whole list. That's the keeping of God's law, his testimonies. Yes. So I've been memorizing it from the New King James Version. Uh -huh. Like the wording going to be pretty closely judged or should it be okay? It's going to be pretty closely judged. Yes. So you'll want to memorize it from the King James if you want the right answer. So, yes. Good question. Good question. Any others? Yes. I, I missed a little at the beginning of this. I'm sorry for that. Yes. Is, is, it, is there, a, how often are you required to quote a verse versus just give an answer? Or do you specify that in the question? Yes. <laughs> yes. There were, um, about the time you came in, I said, um, one of the questions was according to, let's see, quote the verse in answer to the question. And that was for the next one, two, three, four, five. There were five in a row that were quote. But usually they are not quote the whole verse. Typically it will be what is the. Now, if you can quote the verse that it's in, sometimes you may not know the exact answer, but you know the verse it's in. And if you quote the verse, credit is given. <laughs> Because I assume if you knew the verse, that's the answer. Very good. Yes. We are going to do hand raising next week. So we are looking into again getting a buzzer system, and um, a buzzer system ranges in price from small to very expensive. And um, but we're going to check into that. I love it that we are memorizing the scripture and that we are thinking upon the scripture and we're thinking up the answers to questions about the Word of God. Um, in my own just study of Psalm 19, in preparing for questions, preparing questions, the Lord gave to me that this passage tells the terms of time, how often God, God reveals himself day unto day. And the people groups in every language. And that it's geographical locations to all the earth. And there's so much here, it's so rich. So you're doing a great job. Any questions? Any other questions? How many of you are absolutely discouraged? Okay. You're so discouraged you can't even raise your hand. Okay. <laughs> but how many of you are, are encouraged so far? So far encouraged, okay. All right, very good. I know the ones that did not raise their hand there are the ones that are discouraged, okay. <laughs> All right, you're doing very, very well. And I think it's a joy to see um, different ages do it. Next week, I'm going to encourage, and if he doesn't do it, then, um, by the way, thank you men for your help, and our um, timer and scorekeeper. But in the weeks to come when we do this, we are going to say for certain ages. We're going to say for all those 55 and up, this question is for you. Or for all those who are 10 and We'll do some things like that, too, just to give some variation. And um, very good. Once we get going in this, we get a few months into it, we may start deducting for wrong answers. But at this point, I'd rather not. All right. What a great time. So I appreciate your work. And I, I remind you that the great reward of Bible memory is from God. It really is. Okay. We're going to go ahead and begin our service now, and I'll ask Brother Bird if he will come and lead us. Number 64. Number 64, please. Jesus is the joy of living. He's the king. 64. Why don't we stand? You've been sitting for a little while here. Jesus is the joy of living. I have found a wondrous Savior, Jesus Christ, the soul's delight. Every blessing of His favor fills my heart with hope so bright. Jesus is the joy of living. He's the King of life to 
unto him my all I'm giving is forevermore to me. Unto him my all I'm giving is forevermore I'll be. Jesus is the joy of living. He's the dearest friend I know. Life is growing rich with beauty. Toil has lost its weary strength. Now I hail a crown each duty. And I sing a glad refrain. Jesus is the joy of living. He's the king of life to me. Unto him my all I'm giving is forevermore to be. I will be he commands me. Anywhere he leads I'll go. run through a couple things tonight. Don't forget that we have Dr. Scheffler in here next Sunday. We have this Tuesday 55 alive. What time is that? 1 p.m. at Demos. 1 p.m. at Demos. And if you are not quite hitting that 55 alive, you're not quite that old, but um, you do have that time slot open. Sometimes they will bring in honorary younger junior members into the 55 alive category. Brother Sizey. We'll make you an honorary senior. Make you an honorary senior. You will get no discount. There will be no deduction in your bill. But you will be made an honorary senior just for the hour in the way of being able to attend. Okay, so that's this Tuesday. Don't forget the 11th. We're bumping our men's prayer breakfast back from this coming Saturday to the following Saturday. No, it's, uh, well, I guess we're a couple to the 11th. There we go. And um, let's see. Do we have any other announcements? We will be looking forward probably to having our orchestra starting back up in February. So that's the plan. And we'll be getting ready for a Resurrection Sunday coming. So that's just around the corner. And then also wanted to um, remind you, what chapters are we working on Bible memory for February? Does anyone remember? 63. Psalm 61, Psalm 62, and Psalm 63. So the possibility for, possibilities for questions are much, much um, more. And uh, some of you may just want to take one chapter or the other and get it down. Some of you who are more, um, I don't know, 
you're more. If you, uh, then you might want to go for 61 to 63. If you can go for that, I think that'd be a great challenge. Um, also want to pray for Brother Ballinger. He was down today. And then Mrs. Bird, her back, I think the pinch nerve is still giving her a bit of trouble. So pray for her. She's doing better, but she's still feeling it quite a bit. So Mrs. Bird and her health. And then also want to remember Mrs. Koning. Mrs. Koning is, um, she actually was doing well this past Thursday um, and just, just um, declining. But uh, keep praying for her and Brother Koning has a great spirit about him in the whole matter. And I always let him close out our Thursday night uh, Bible study and prayer time and prayer and just in great encouragement. I want to also ask that you would keep in prayer Bible Baptist in, in their uh, transition time. And then also pray for the, the, um, the ministry he came from. That as he, I think there's someone I just heard this morning that may be stepping up to take his place so that we have an independent Baptist lobbyist in the State House of Tennessee. Pray that goes well. Um, that, that is a very important matter because you get the wrong person and they won't be bold enough to stand up and speak the truth to the authorities. We need someone who's bold and courageous and a gentleman and gracious. And so this is extremely important in that transition time. Okay, let's go on with our next hymn, and thank you, Brother Bird. Um, Pastor Snodley had his first Sunday today. It's not, not a very normal when you call a pastor, he starts the next week. It, usually it's maybe sometimes a couple of months before they get there as they move from their previous place, but he lives in Hendersonville, goes to church there, so it worked out uh, really smooth uh, for them to, to do that as well. I was just thinking this morning when Pastor was speaking about sanctity of human life today, um, those many March for Life times, there's nothing like a March for Life in Minnesota, just believe me. I mean, I would be doing it sometimes when it was uh, 20 below wind chill and things out there, it was tough. You had to dress right for it. It was a tough time to march for life over there, but we did it, and sometimes there was lots of snow and things, and we had to stand there and listen to the speakers speak and all that, and it got very cold, and, uh, and um, I took my classroom there, and then afterwards, my pastor insisted that we go to a spot that was kind of favorite uh, to him. For lunch. He would take them out, and, and we would uh, go for lunch there. His favorite spot, in that area by the state capitol was to go to White Castle. <laughs> I never could figure out why he enjoyed White Castle, but uh, he did. We don't have that much down here, but we have Crystals, which is pretty close to White Castle. I went there when I first moved down here because I didn't know what it was. And I found out it was like White Castle. I, I went there once. <laughs> Brought back too many memories of that square burger with all the holes in it. <laughs> if you've never been to White Castle, you haven't missed a thing. <laughs> so now you're curious, maybe you'll want to go and check it out, see if I'm right. Just want to tell you that the choir will not be having practice next week. That's our normal time, the last Sunday of the month. And then we sing on the first. Because of the afternoon services like we're having and, and with the quizzing time and things, we're going to move it back. And so we'll have it on the first Sunday of February will be our practice time, and then we'll sing on the second Sunday of February. So I just want to let you know about that ahead of time. You'll be getting an email about it. But if you are interested in joining the choir, wait till the first Sunday in February and come out and enjoy singing with us as we practice. Number 443, what a day that will be. Number 443. There is coming a day when no heartache shall come, no more clouds in the sky, no more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore. On
sing the first and last verse of this one, just when I need him most. Jesus is near to comfort and cheer just when I need him most. Just when I need Just when I need before you a matter tonight, right before we open the scriptures, and something I've been considering very seriously. And we have, for I think over 10 years now, been sponsoring our young people for camp. And they're able to earn their way to camp through Bible memory and through reading of Christian biographies. And I would like to, over the next year, I've been considering doing something different. And that is allowing the young people to be able to, instead of earning their way to camp, I don't mind if, if the ones who still want to earn their way to camp do that, but there may be some who would choose to earn their way toward a missions trip. And I think that if we could uh, visit one of our missionaries and spend some time there and get, do some research, find out what mission field would be best, and then see uh, how much the total cost would be. Um, I, th I don't think we can pay for the whole thing, but I think we can put about the same amount we would normally put toward camp. We will give opportunity to earn their way toward a missions trip. Now, generally speaking, if you would decide to do that, you would also, you, young people, if you're interested in something like that, and I would, I would raise the bar on that age group a little higher so that it's not just teenagers, but we'll go above that. You see how, you see how we as a church are working toward Bible memory and memorizing Psalm 19. I see this as an added advantage of church-wide memory. Um, I know it could be costly, but you know what? I'm willing to put the money into missions experience and at the same time into Bible memory. So when it comes to Bible memory, um, I'd like to give you further details later, but I'm looking at the possibility of visiting a mission field where we could, uh, you would have to subsidize by sending out, if you're a young person, sending out letters to your own family members or your friends and just saying I'm planning on going on a missions trip and if you wanted to help I would appreciate your prayers and also your support if you're able to and to send out letters like that I would also encourage young people to put some serious elbow grease into it and get a job work, mow grass do what you can and that way you'll have put some sweat equity into getting to the mission field, and I think you'll get more out of it. But this is something I'm considering now, and I know there's a lot that would go into it, and it's a lot of planning and um, financial um, 
but it's good for us to walk by faith. And it's good for a young person to say, not just I want to go, but I'm going to work hard toward that. I'm going to memorize scripture toward that. And I'm going to pray, ask God if he would not allow me to go. I, I would only allow a young person to do this with their parents allowing them and wanting them to go. So young person, if you're interested in that, and I mean you're, you're seriously, would you like to go on a mission trip? The first thing to do is to get with your folks. And then after that, we'll talk about it again in the future. Okay, I wanted to get that across because I just wanted that extra spur as we continue to memorize these chapters. Okay, Galatians chapter 6. Very brief tonight, this afternoon. Very brief, Galatians chapter 6. Our lives are relatively short. And our energy and strength is relatively small. And so what we give our strength and our life to is very important. We're going to give our strength of our years and our life to something. We spend our years as a tale that's told. And so life passes very quickly. And I want to challenge you to invest in things that matter and use the strength of your youth in things that matter and use the strength of your days in things that matter. And so I'm going to Galatians chapter 6 with just a challenge this afternoon about asking you what really matters. What you're doing right now, what does it matter? You say, well, what's the matter with, with what I'm doing? Yeah, that's my question. What is it about? What are you giving yourself to? Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 to 9 are so well known to us. But let's read them together again. All together out loud, Galatians 6, 7, and 9. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit reap life everlasting. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Are you tired? Join the rest of us. Life is tiring. Life is wearing. Um, but let's not be weary. Let's not be weary, especially in well-doing. I want you to see some verses on well-doing and on weariness. We go to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. You know this verse. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord, are you giving your life to God day by day? The work of the Lord. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 13 says, But ye, brethren, be not weary in... Well doing. There it is again. And then I'd like you to see Romans 2 7. Romans chapter 2, verse 7. I realize I'm not giving you a lot of time to get there. But Romans chapter 2, verse 7 says, To them who by patient continuance in well doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. Well, there's lots of verses about this. I think of 1 Peter 4.19, Wherefore, let him that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing, as unto a faithful creator. Well, we all, we all want people to look at Berean Baptist Church and to see and recognize that is God's work. We want people to see the hand of God in our lives. We as Christians, we want to, 
We want to be busy about our father's business, but I want you to remember this. Being physically tired is okay. Being emotionally tired is okay. Even being spiritually tired is okay. But let's not be weary in well-doing. It's... You ever, you ever sit down at the end of a day? I do sometimes. I'll sit down at the end of a day, and I don't take a nap. It takes me. <laughs> I just sat down. It just took me. I got me. I shouldn't have sat down yet. How many of you, when you sit down, you just, you better not sit down for long, because you'll go. It will take over. Well, you work on something so long. You ever worked on it so long that you start dreaming about it? I dream about projects that I'm working on. If I'm working, 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 I go to bed and I dream about them. Um, And then I wake up and feel tired like I've been working all night. (laughs) But there is a difference between being physically tired, that's okay, and being weary in well-doing, and that's not good. Because the Bible says, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Now, why should you keep on serving the Lord? Why should we? Well, in these verses, there's several reasons. Number one, look at the word us in verse number nine. And let us not be weary in well-doing. There's a veiled compliment there. What is he telling the Galatians? You're doing well. Don't be wearied. But he says us. Paul doesn't say, I'm doing well. He says, let us not be weary in well-doing. So, Why should we keep on going? Number one, you are doing well. Don't quit now. Seems to be what verse 9 says. Let us not be weary in well-doing. Number two, your adversary, the devil, will eventually get his. By the way, all who oppose God will eventually pay for it. I see this up in verse number 7. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. A third reason to keep on going when you're tired is because of the word do in verse 9. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season. In other words, you know what? Your time is in God's hand. Number three, your time is in God's hand. In due time, it'll be worth it. In due time. Has it come due yet? Oh, I've got bills coming due. Do you have bills coming due? Um, we just received our insurance um, bill for, and the you know, insurance have gone up some. And um, I expected it. It always comes due. You know, they, they increase it as they usually do. But um, there is a due season in which, listen to this, we shall reap. That's encouraging. That's encouraging. Our times are in God's hands. And number four, All our troubles are seasonal. All of our troubles are seasonal. It says you shall reap. There's a reaping, rewarding day coming. Whatever your trouble is. Um, We have folks in our church that have, we have have two or three folks right now, two that I know of, that are being tested for cancer. I don't know how it's going to come back, but I can tell you this. There's coming a day when all that will be passed. And it will be a great day of reward and reaping. Number five, your day of reaping is coming. Shall reap. I gave you, when it says, when you think of the trials that are seasonal in in number four that I pointed out, the very word season's in the verse, isn't it? In due season. Well, what, what is today? It's planting time. It's planting time. It's time to sow the seed. Now, there's ways that we need to sow seed. Um, there's, by the way, um, there's ways our church has been sowing seed for years that we, we will never know what God did. Uh, we have up on the highway in the interstate out there, we have a sign that says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And it says, Prepare to meet thy God. And Brother Van McCormick is getting older. And Brother McCormick is probably going to go to home to heaven very soon. He has... Um, he has a brain tumor, and he has another serious issue. And um, he's in constant pain unless he sits extremely still. 
When he moves, when he stands up, he has terrible pain. But I imagine he's going to go home to heaven soon. And um, I don't know if that sign will be passed on to a son or a daughter who will not have the same burden of Scripture. But these years were a time of planting. And you and I do not know what can come of that. Rebecca um, came across just, there was um, someone who was saying something about the sign out on the interstate. And what a terrible place to have a sign. That's a dangerous spot in the road. And Rebecca was saying to me, you know what? That's a, that's a place where you, have, you, you need to have the sign, prepare to meet God. It's a dangerous place. And it's not like people sit there looking at the sign all day as they go by. There, there are billboards with pictures and all kinds of graphics and things that, of, of um, immodesty and indecency that draw people's eyes off the roads 24-7 out on the interstates and highways and byways of life to have a few words up there that say, prepare to meet thy God. Is not doing the damage those other signs are. You know, this is, this is a time of, of, of sowing. We're sowing. Mr. Mr. James is going out, and Matthew goes out, and, and sometimes others will go out with him, and they're sowing for the bus ministry, aren't they? And our bus ministry has gotten, it's gotten to be harder sowing. Breaking up the ground out there is harder now than it's ever been. And yet, Mr. James was out there, and I'm sure he wouldn't want me to say this, but he was out there playing soccer with some boys yesterday so that he could have inroads to talk to those boys about the Lord Jesus Christ, see him come to church. And he told me he's not getting any younger in soccer. I don't know. You know what? But I'll tell you this. There's more ways. <laughs> there's more ways to sow. There's more ways to sow. Some of them involve a personal investment. I think bus ministry is one of the harder ones because it's every Saturday, every Saturday. What time did you stop bus ministry yesterday, Brother James? Okay. Left, you left here about 11? And what time did you get back? A little after 2. So, two-hour, three-hour commitment. You know what? Sewing. 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 There's so many ways to plant. There are some who plant and they go around with gospel, gospel tracts and they put tracts in people's hands and they ask them to read it. I've got a little girl this past week, Jubilee, who we were in, who we were in Lowe's about to check out and she looked up at me and said, Papa, you need to give this lady a tract. Well, I knew the lady. I said, Judy, my daughter says that I ought to give you a gospel tract. And she looked at her and I already knew Judy. Judy was a Christian. And Judy looked at her and she said, thank you so much. She said, for caring for my soul. She said, you know what? I've already trusted in Jesus. What's your name? And she said, Jubilee. And she said, Jubilee, I want you to know I read my Bible every morning before I come to Lowe's. And God talks to me. And I'm a child of God. And Jubilee looked like, I don't know what to do with all of this. <laughs> but I'll tell you this. Little ones can help plant seeds too. And you know what? And that just challenges Papa to, you know what? We need, to, we need to get the word out. Yes, even to the cash register at Lowe's. There's so many ways to plant the seed. And it can be tiring, and it can be wearing, and we can be a little concerned about what people say. But you know what? Payday's coming. Reward's coming. You'll never regret it that someday you passed out that track. It's... Why should you serve God when you're tired is my question for today. And what does it matter what you're doing? Does it matter? What are you invested in? Why should you serve the Lord, number one? Because good does eventually triumph. Verse 7 is a warning. Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Good does eventually triumph. And it's so easy to be deceived and think that evil is winning. But it's a, it's a mirage. It's a mirage. Evil will triumph seemingly and then fail completely. And good will fail seemingly and triumph forever. 
It may not happen on your time scale, but good will triumph. God will triumph. Number two, God is still in control and he won't be mocked. God is still in control and he will not be mocked. Just a, th- a thought of encouragement this afternoon that no one is going to make God a laughing stock and get away with it. No one is going to mock and ridicule. People may say what they want, but God will not tolerate it forever. Um, there, there, there's, there's sometimes there are, there are phrases in the Bible that I look at and I say, why is that there? That's curious. Like when God looked down from heaven and he saw the evil of man's heart that it was only evil continually. Or you look and God looked down at the, or when he looked down at the Tower of Babel and he saw men um, building to make themselves a name. And the Bible says God came down. Does God need to come down? Well, there's a vivid picture of a visit from God that is not pleasant. Did you know that God will not be mocked? You know what? You're going to serve something. You're going to sow something. There's no neutral ground. Everybody's got a bag. Everyone's got a seed bag. You're sowing. You're sowing. A crop's going to come up. What are you sowing to? I'll just tell you, I, I would rather live in the realm of tired and sow good seed than to live always rested, sowing to the flesh. God's in control. He won't be mocked. Number three, your seed is producing a crop right now. I think it's so exciting to be a co-laborer with the Lord Jesus Christ and to be laborers together. This is, our life is not carefree. Our life is not weary free. But you know what? There are people in our church that they're going to get up on Monday morning and they're going to go to work. And when they get to work, they're going to meet people and the person's going to look at them and they're going to say, how are you doing? You're going to say, I'm, I'm tired. And you're going to say to them, how are you doing? And they're going to go, I am wiped out. I am so tired. And you're going to think, I served God and I'm tired. They didn't serve God and they're tired. I'd rather be serving God. I'd rather be serving the Lord. This is, uh, have you discovered that just tired is a way of life? Have you noticed that? Tired is part of life. And that's okay. That's all right. And I've, I've learned as I've, as I've been in several different churches that for many people, pain is a way of life. That's awful. We hate that. We, we don't want that. I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful that we have, even though people are tired at Brian Baptist often, thank you for serving. We're laborers together. Uh, this is, you know, we're, we're going to be tired. We might as well be tired about God's business. Number four, there is eternity. There is eternity. You know, there's, this is not the end. There's more to life than what we see. And the Bible says it over and over in this, in this passage. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. It goes on and says, we shall reap if we faint not. But I want you to look at verse 8 in particular. He, For he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. There is an enjoyment of life everlasting that is better for having served God and sowed to the Spirit. There's there's two passages in the Bible that really stump people. In fact, stump Christians that would be typical in our circles. And they both have to do with if you do this sin, this sin, and this sin, and this sin, then you will not inherit eternal life. Two passages. One's in Galatians. One's in Corinthians. And there are some groups of false teachings that love that because they say that, you know what, little sins are okay. I don't, I don't get that part at all. But they say, but if you commit a big sin, you'll lose your salvation. What they're basically doing is they're talking about most of, like the Church of Christ would not use the word mortal sins and venial sins. They would not use that terminology. That would be a Catholic terminology. But they think in those terms. 
Because the Church of Christ believe you can lose your salvation. But they don't believe you lose it for small things. They believe you lose it for big things. And if you ask them which ones, they will take you sometimes to the verses that say that if you do this, 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 and this, then you won't inherit eternal life. But the whole, right after that, it says, and such were some of you. And what's amazing is, it's the word inheritance. Did you know that there's some sins if you get into, you will, you'll still go to heaven, but you will not enjoy the full inheritance of heaven. It talks about that in 2 John. That if we, if we bring someone into our home that does not bring the doctrine of Christ, it says that we're to beware lest we lose those things which we have earned or wrought. And it says, be careful lest you... And it says that you want to... The words are that you want to have a, quote, full reward. A full reward. Did you know there's some sins, if you get into it, it will jeopardize the fullness of your inheritance, but it won't jeopardize heaven. So, with these things, and you know this, you know there's some people that if you suffer for him, you shall also reign with him. The Bible says this. And the Bible talks about crowns that will be given for those who suffer for righteousness' sake. And there's five different crowns of, of rewards of righteousness. But on the flip side, 2 John tells us that you can lose your, lose your rewards too if you, if you get involved with the wrong crowd of people. And so there's this sense in which in this passage he says, if you will sow to the Spirit, you'll of the Spirit reap life everlasting. It's not saying that if you, if you work real well and work real hard, you'll go to heaven and have everlasting life. That's not what it's saying. It's saying, if you'll sow to the Spirit, it'll show and you'll enjoy it more ever, everlasting. You'll enjoy that life everlasting all the more. And of course, the Bible does say this is life everlasting, that they might know thee. So, there is eternity to come. And I think of people that are invested in King's kids in our church. What a joy it is to have kids who you've helped them memorize Scripture. And you've worked with them and taught them by the Scriptures. And I think of those who work in different ways. We have people who volunteer to clean the church. And it's such a... I always think of back there, years ago, I preached a message and it talked about lily work. Anyone remember that? Lily work? And how in the temple, at the top of these pillars in Solomon's temple, the Bible says... Right below the roof, there were lilies that were to be were carved into the rock at the top of the pillars, and then they put the roof on. And I made the point is, no one could even see the lily work up there, but someone had to carve it out of solid rock. And there are some works that are behind the scenes and so invisible, no one even sees your work for God but one. And it's still worth it. It's still worth it. Because there's an eternity that's coming. And some of you have taught Sunday school class, or you've assisted in Sunday school class. And the Bible says in the end times, not even a person who's given a cup of water to a Jewish person during that time that will be 10,000 times worse than, than World War II, Hitler's Germany, during the time of Jacob's trouble, if you just hand a Jew a drink of water, you will not lose your reward. I think of the God who gives and rewards. And what a day it's going to be in heaven. And finally, I'd like to say, last of all, that reaping will only happen if we don't quit. Reaping will only happen if we do not quit. That's verse 9. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. So, we shall reap. There's the qualification. What is it? If we faint not. So, in, in, in the setting of, of agriculture, how many of you have grown up, you grew up on a farm where 
things are planted. Would you slip a hand up in the air? You grew up in a farm where things are planted. Would you keep your plans up? hands up? One, two, three, four, five, six. So we have represent, representatives from six different families um, who your families, you grew up in a planting family. So which part of it was work? You had, to, you had to get the seed. You had to get up and plant the seed. How long were you planting seed, Brother James? Forever. <laughs> forever. Forever. Must have seemed like it. April, May, mud permitting. That's just the corn. Different crops get planted at different times. There's sowing. And then there's work in the fields between. There's watering sometimes. There's fertilizing. There's all the things that go into it. If you use insecticides, then there's all these things for going out in the fields and having to bring it in. And if, you, if the weather allows and you're able to get it in in time, then you have a crop. And there are some times weather doesn't permit. And all your work, all the work of all that time you spent out there is in the field. And it stays in the field and it rots down. And that never happens spiritually. It never happens that if you serve God and you serve Him faithfully and you've done everything in this area for all, Lord, it's all for you. It's not for me. God doesn't say, well, no reward. It's, it's wonderful that we shall reap if we faint not. There's so much work that goes into farming. So much work that goes in the process of just getting food to the grocery store. And yet God says, you know what? There's a spiritual day coming. It was on my mind this past week as I was working through a, a section in Joshua. Joshua is all about the entrance into the promised land and the dividing up by lot, the inheritance to the tribes of Israel. It's evenly split, 24 chapters, 12 and 12. So you've got 12 chapters on entering the land and the battles and the conquering, and then 12 chapters on the dividing up of the land. And I was thinking about how going, the, the whole book is all about, for us, the promised land is a picture of the victorious Christian life. And how there's battles, and there's hardship, and there's struggles, and there's an enemy to face, and there's a war to fight. And how Israel had these promises that if you will obey my commandments, if you'll love the Lord your God with all of your heart, he said in Deuteronomy 26, 28, that I'll, you'll, your fields, your crops will come up. I'll bless your crops. I'll give the enemies into your hand. I'll fight the battles for you. It is Joshua. It's this, if you'll serve me, you'll be financially blessed. True? It is. If you don't serve me, the heavens will turn as brass. It won't rain. If you continue, I'll bring in an enemy from outside and you'll be taken captivity. We don't have that financial promise. There's no promise for you that if you serve God, you will have financial prosperity. Your crops will be great. But you do have promises that if you serve God spiritually, spiritually, you will be blessed. That there is a reward that's coming that you and I ought to be able to get up and say, Lord, I'm in the battle for my Lord today. And I'm surrendering to you, not to my flesh. I'm surrendering to you. I'm going to serve you, not this world. And Lord, I want to give all I've got for you. And you know what? There is a promise. There are promises all through the scripture that we will reap if we sow to the Spirit. These are ours. That there is a day coming where it's going to be a great day in heaven with the Lord. It's hard to picture, isn't it? It's hard to picture the day coming when we have, we, we look around and the Kellys are in heaven and the Randalls are in heaven and the Jameses and 
Miss Joan and Davidson and Layman all around the room and to, and to be there and to have a great Bema seat reward. And our sins are under the blood of Jesus Christ, washed away as far as, but there is a day of reward. Can I remember the Bema seat judgment? The Bema was in Corinth. It was the place where at the end of the Olympic Games, they went up and they were to, the winners were to stand up on the Bema. And that's where the, the rewards were given. And God talks about the judgment seat of Christ, which is called the Bema seat judgment, where the rewards are given. And it's so hard to imagine that there's a time coming when you, you, some of you, you don't want to stand in front of the church, much less be on the Bema seat judgment. For you to, would you come up and pray for us today? Oh, Pastor, could you get somebody else? You know, but it's a wonderful thing that your God, your Lord and Savior, who loves you, looks forward to rewarding you. So incredible, so humbling. And when I think of that, I think, you know what? I'm going to serve anyway. I'm going to work for someone anyway. I'm going to sow to something. I'm going to get tired anyway. I might as well get tired serving the Lord with all my heart. I might as well sow with everything I got. I might as well give myself to the serious business of God because some days I sit down and I'm physically tired. But I'll tell you this, there's coming a day when we will not be weary anymore. So it's best that we say, Lord, the Bema seat's coming. Help me not to be weary in well-doing, not to faint. Because in due season, we will be rewarded. Father in heaven, I do ask that you'd help us, that we would be strengthened in our love for you, in our commitment to you. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us, that there are some in this room who are, they're just tired. They're weary. Maybe for some it's been a hard winter already with some sickness going around. I'm asking that you would strengthen our hands to do the labor. Whether it's lily work that nobody else sees but you, or whether it's sowing at Lowe's. Lord, I pray that old and young, we would acknowledge, I'm going to give my life anyway. I'm going to live my life anyway. I might as well, with all I've got, give it and live it for my Lord. How many this afternoon would say, I'm physically tired, but I'm not weary in well-doing? Would you slip a hand up in the air? Physically tired, but I'm not weary in well-doing. Physically tired. How many would say that I'm going to get tired anyway? I would rather get tired serving the Lord than anything else. Would you say? At you? I'm going to get tired anyway. I'm going to be weir wearied at the end of the day sometimes, but I'd rather be tired serving you than any other way. Any other way. How many would say, I've not been giving the strength of my days to the Lord? And the Lord spoke to me about that this afternoon. That if I will sow to the Spirit, and work, labor for him, there'll be a great day of reward. I've not been giving my strength to the Lord of each day, and I want to do that. Would you stand up in the air? I've not been giving my strength to the Lord. You know what I find interesting? I can do the same work giving my strength to the Lord, or I can do the same work not doing it for the Lord. I can say, Lord, I'm doing this for your honor, for your glory. Or I can say, Lord, I can just go through the day and not give it to him. I might as well do it for him. It's the same job. It's the same work, but for God's glory. Father in heaven, again, I thank you so much that you've given us a amount of strength, an amount of energy 
for each day. I know that it's always sufficient by your grace. But Lord, I'm asking you to help us that we would not be weary in well-doing, that we would reap and faint not. Would you strengthen us, help us, Lord, to say, I'm going to get tired by the end of the day anyhow. I'd rather get tired serving my Lord who loved me and gave himself for me. May we be, as you said, my beloved brethren, always abounding in the work of the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You're dismissed.